Phew! It's been a long, long while since I've uploaded a video. This was not intentional. I had intended for these shorts to be like short videos that I upload semi-frequently to talk about certain types of discourse or just anything that was on my mind, really. Please ignore the fact that I already had something for this. However, circumstances in my personal life kind of prevented me from really capitalizing on this new video trend. I kind of mentioned this in the end of the year video that I made last December, but I had a lot of stuff going on. I have therefore decided to make this catching up video, in which I'm gonna go to some of the discourse that I've missed in the interim. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna go to this relatively quickly. Let's start with some personal life stuff, shall we? So last December, I mentioned that there was significant chance that I might become homeless. However, I am happy to report that at the time of writing, have I not only found a home, I have also moved and are presently living at my new living space. And by the gods was the process agonizing. So what happened? Why did I suddenly have to move? I will talk about the systemic issues that caused this in a later video, but to give some context, in 2016 I started living on my own at a special apartment complex specifically tailored for autistic people. I had my own studio apartment with my own kitchen and front door and everything, but I also got coaching there to help me live a normal life. I've had my ups and downs living there, but I've definitely managed to build up a history, history for the last six and a half years. However, to live where I lived at the time, you need a certain type of bureaucratic stamp that essentially tells you that you are eligible to receive the coaching that you need and every year they check in on you with a meeting to make sure that you're still in the need of said coaching and are not committing fraud. Now I'd been wanting to move out of there since 2020. I did most things on my own fine, and the coaching was mostly of a mental health nature. However, trying to find a, new, find a new place to live right now is equivalent to finding the one person on Tinder that's all trying to catfish you. It is a time consuming task and you need to be extremely lucky. New liberal politics has made finding a house near impossible, so I had been looking for a long time already. Then in November last year, disaster struck. The bureaucrats, who had decided whether I could still live there, essentially decided that I was not eligible anymore, so starting January 2000. 23, I had 6 months to find a new place to live or else I would get kicked out. Obviously, this caused a bit of a panic for me. I had been looking for a new place to live for almost 3 years at that point and I knew that finding something was gonna be near impossible. The stated reason for not receiving a renewal of said bureaucratic stamp was because I, allegedly, did not need said coaching anymore and because I had rejected a place to live a few months earlier. Now that last part is admittedly true. However, the main reason I had rejected that house is because it needed massive repairs, something that the social housing organization was most likely not gonna do and I could not afford. This was something that was unsurprisingly completely ignored by the institution because fuck looking at the personal life of the people you're making these decisions for, right? So there I was, basically watching my entire life fall apart. It was like everything I had worked on for the last 6 years had been for nothing. So I did what any sane person would do and had a mental breakdown on the spot. After that however, I started looking for a new place like my life depended on it, and in a sense it did. By a combination of sheer tenacity, desperation and luck, I somehow managed to find a new place to live, after being rejected for a few other places of course. I fucking hate gentrification. And then came moving. And holy hell was it painful. This new studio apartment is essentially a downgrade in almost every respect from what I had. I lost 6 square meters and I had to do a truckload of maintenance on the thing. The fact that I had basically every organization working against me constantly did not help either. It might have costed me 2000 euros, about half of the stuff that I owned that I had to throw out, and a fuckload of mental health issues, but... I have finally moved over. All in all, my life from November until now has been fucking awful because of this stuff. I've basically lost all trust in governments, institutions, organizations, and worst of all, other people because of this shit. It has become very clear to me that the way society is structured means that the deck is gonna be stacked against me on every level, and I'm gonna need to redo some mental health stuff to try to come to terms with that. Don't get me wrong, I am glad I managed to avoid homelessness. A lot of people have not been so lucky, but the price I am paying for my small mistake is excessively steep. It is a victory, but a costly one. I also want to make very clear that I've managed to avoid homelessness despite the efforts of the Dutch government, not because of it. I will make a video near the future in which I delve into more detail about this, but for now I'm just glad that I can pick up my life again and look to the future. <laughs> I swear, I must have pissed off some ancient pre-Christian deity or something, because I just have the worst shit happen to me at the worst possible timing. 
Okay. So when I got this studio apartment, I was supposed to have an intake meeting about this. Of course this means that I catch COVID right on the fucking weekend before I have this meeting. And let me tell you, COVID fucking sucks. For almost three years, I managed to avoid it. And right in the fucking week when the government declares the pandemic to be over, I catch it. Oh, the goddamn irony. So this all meant that I had to go into quarantine. Thankfully, because I got my shots and boosters was the time period that I actually felt like shit relatively little. I had one bad night and a crappy day and that was essentially it. It felt to me just like a shitty flu. However, because I was of course still contagious, I had to stay inside for a little over a week. Everything about the entire situation just sucked. The timing was bad of course, but the main reason I bring this up is because I feel that most people have just forgotten about COVID. Like we're currently in this weird state where it's less of a big deal than it used to be, but there's still plenty of people getting infected and sick. Of course, this is only worse in places that don't have access to decent healthcare. Kind of messed up how our governments just decided to ignore it and condemn people to death. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, COVID sucks. Next subject. Oh boy, this one is gonna be controversial. Which is dumb because it really should not be. I am very late to the party, but we need to have a little chat about Hogwarts Legacy. So in February an open world game set in the Harry Potter universe was released called Hogwarts Legacy. This has caused a fair share of controversy and discourse because this is a major release for the Harry Potter universe and also its controversial author JK Rowling. I have been informed that most people who are not terminally online like myself are aware of this, but Rowling has been extremely controversial these last few years due to her extremely blatant transphobia. This is also not even something that's really up for debate. She tweets transphobic stuff quite often and has, oft and has also been a major driver force behind the current wave of transphobia that's currently targeting trans people. If you want more information, Sean has made several videos about the subject that I will link to below. Anyway, the, re the release of this game unleashed a wave of discourse, because you suddenly had a lot of self-proclaimed allies coming out of the woodwork and asking trans people if it was okay if they played the game. And then said allies would then get mad and cry harassment if trans people replied that they would rather not have people play the game. Now, we can argue about the effectiveness of boycotts all day, and the question of separating art from the artist is one that has been asked many times before, and is also one that never really gets a satisfying answer in my opinion. But in this particular case, the response of a lot of cis people has been really disappointing. Especially because a lot of these people should know better. I don't know if you have noticed, but right now it's a situation for many trans people across the globe pretty bad. We are undergoing a wave of transphobia brought on by the far right in many countries, and this has led to a lot of problems, many of them life-threatening. Most American conservative states are currently passing anti-trans legislation that at best bars trans people from public spaces and at worst can cost them their lives. The UK government has basically all but stated that they've declared war on trans people, and for all of you smug Europeans like myself who go, oh, Oh, that only happens in America. No, it happens over here as well. The Dutch fascistic assholes of the FAD has been stoking the fire of transphobia a lot on social media, and these acts of stochastic terrorism has led to death threats to queer rights organizations like the COC, far-right protests at drag queen performances, violence in the streets, and many cases where people with pride flags got bricks thrown through their windows. Recently, also a series of emails leaked out of conversations between prominent American conservative politicians that basically flat out stated that they wanted to exterminate all queer people. So I think it's pretty clear that we're in a lot of trouble right now. In the face of all of this, it can appear that the plight of one video game is negligible. However, I would argue that JK Rowling has been a major player behind this all, and in my opinion any piece of media she releases should come with the label that she's an advocate for hatred and deserves pushback for that. I consider myself to be non-binary, and as such I technically fall under the trans umbrella, although to be honest I consider myself to be somewhat lazy in this regard. I have thought about doing transitioning stuff, but I have had to come to the hard realization that, as n that it, this is not something that's really doable for me in this current climate. Now, thankfully, I am not dysphoric, so the consequences for me are relatively small, but it does show that this kind of stuff has consequences and we really should be pushing back against this. Now, I want to make clear that I don't think that everyone that played Hogwarts Legacy is a transphobe, nor do I think that we should harass people for it. However, if you willingly bought the game and gave money to JK Rowling, despite knowing how transphobic she is, then you don't really have the right to call yourself a queer ally in my opinion. The sad part of this all is that you all could have gotten the game, just not told anyone and enjoyed it and everything would have been fine. But you all had to seek that validation and thumbs up from us. And now we're all fighting with each other. You cannot have your cake and eat it too, that's not how it works. 
Anyway, power to all trans folk and let us all fight against this hatred. Pim out! Time for something a bit more lighthearted. On January 28th, America woke up to a weird high altitude balloon of Chinese origin hanging above US airspace. This balloon had drifted across the Pacific Ocean, coming from the west, and was moving eastward across the entire continental United States. Both the US and Canadian militaries claimed that the balloon was a spy balloon, while China claimed that it was a weather balloon for scientific purposes. This balloon continued its trip eastward across the US till it was shot down on February 4 on the order of the American President Biden above the coast of South Carolina. Its debris was then collected by the Americans and sent to some FBI site for analysis. Unsurprisingly, the giant circus that is American media proceeded to freak out the moment news of the balloon broke. Far-right news channel, Fox News in particular, had a tizzy. Tucker Carlson, the lowest form of life, had a fit talking about how the Biden administration was just allowing this spy balloon to just fly across the country and spy on all patriotic Americans. Hey, so this is Pim from the future here, and I am. And as I was editing this video, I got the news that Tucker Carlson got kicked out of Fox News. I I am not really sure why this happened, or the why, or the how, or the when, but um, this is clearly another major victory for the left. Our commun our communist re revolution can never be stopped now. Ha ha ha. Completely disregarding the fact that the balloon was flying across some of the mostly, most densely populated parts of the country, and that shooting it down that early may have caused a massive incident with this massive balloon falling on someone's house or something. As far as I'm concerned, was waiting for the balloon to be above water before shooting it down probably a good call. A few states even had to issue warnings for people to not go outside and shoot at the fucking thing, since it was too high up for a small arms fire to reach it. Which is just objectively funny to me. It's just the most stereotypical American thing ever and reminds you of those idiots that decided that the best way to deter a hurricane was to shoot at it. Now I want to make clear, I'm not saying that it is impossible for the balloon to be a spy balloon. Personally I think it's improbable since in my very limited view it just seems impractical to use a spy balloon when you have things like satellites. But then I am also not a spy master so I could be wrong about that. I am saying, however, that it was very funny to see every American conservative freak out over this thing. Conservatism is just a dumb ideology in general, whose entire existence is contingent on making the lives of everyone that's not a rich white guy a living hell, so to see them freak out over something like this is just incredibly funny and cathartic. Yeah, I've got nothing else to add, really. Conservatives can be scared with balloons. Maybe they'll let loose a fuckload of balloons at CPAC in the future. <laughs> Train derailment season started early this year, when on February 3rd, Norfolk Southern decided to derail a freight train carrying hazardous materials in the town of East Palestine, Ohio. About 38 cars derailed, most of which were carrying nasty stuff like vinyl chloride. The cars burned for several days till Norfolk Southern decided to do a controlled burn, by which I mean that they released a fuckload of hazardous chemicals like hydrogen chloride and phosgene into the air and soil. Residents within a one mile radius were evacuated for a while, only to return to find that their homes had essentially been chemically bombed by Norfolk Southern. The entire incident was a stunning display of the incompetence of Norfolk Southern, local governments and the US federal government and it set off quite of a chain of discourse. Meaning that you had a lot of people who know jack shit about trains and railroading who suddenly had to talk about trains and railroading. The result has been extremely exhausting to read and watch. I don't think it's a secret to anyone that I'm quite a big train buff, and watching this discussion unfold has been the equivalent of hitting myself in the head with a frying pan several times because of this dumb stupidity that I've seen on display. The fact that this is done by a group of people from a country that barely has any passenger rail left does not help either. Obviously the US has its own share of rail fans and urbanists who are in the know, but your average American journalist is usually not one of those, and the result is that you get the dumbest fucking takes possible when it comes to this subject. 
Alan Fisher made a video about the subject that I will link to below, but to summarize, no, air brakes are not a quote, civil war era braking system, unquote, and ECP brakes would have done nothing to prevent this accident from happening. The issue had to do with a bearing that caught fire and had been on fire for over 20 miles before it gave out. To fix problem like that, you need to structurally change the way railroading works in America. Again, watch the Alan Fisher video for more details. This incident, however, also suddenly, had a, suddenly got people interested in railroads. And suddenly you had a lot of people figuring out that derailments and incidents like this are quite common. The far right of course had their own spin on it. They were talking about how the entire balloon incident, which was happening simultaneously, was a cover up for this. And I can tell you that as a filthy European, I could usually following follow what was happening at the time without much issues. If you think it was a cover up or some kind of news blackout, then you are a stupid idiot who needs to get off that Twitter echo chamber. Since East Palestine, there have been several major derailments, including one by Union Pacific, which might have broken the speed limit for a diesel train in North America. Congratulations to UP, by the way, if that's the case. However, there have also been a few major train incidents in Europe. In Greece, a head-on collision happened between two trains, one freight train and one passenger intercity train, which killed at least 57 people and, in and injured 85 of them, making it the deadliest train crash in Greek history. The crash happened due to alleged neglected maintenance on the signaling system, meaning that the signaling had to be done by hand, and thus an error like this could happen. Recently, also, in my neck of the woods, a passenger train crashed into a maintenance crane near the town of Voorschoten, killing one person and injuring dozens. This one is still being investigated as I'm currently writing this, but it seems likely that the crane operator was at a place where they had not been given permission to go yet by dispatch. All in all, these last few months have been wrought with incidents and disasters. Now, admittedly, a lot of these are highlighted because, of the, East, because the East Palestine derailment is still fresh in everyone's memory. So obviously, media is gonna focus on that, but in the case of the American crashes, is there also more going on? Last December, the Biden administration signed a bill that blocked a major rail strike from happening and thus might have been indirectly responsible for the terror at East Palestine. Rail workers in America have been talking about this for years now, but these derailments are accidents waiting to happen due to cost-cutting measures of the class 1 railroads. There is a good podcast episode about this entire thing that I will link to below that goes into more detail, but needless to say is what we're seeing here the result of decades of cost-cutting and the class 1's trying to make as much profit as possible at the expense of everyone else. I am still standing on my little hill of train good of course, but the way railroading works in North America, it needs to be drastically overhauled if we want to prevent stuff like this from happening in the future. <laughs> I have gotten into Total Warhammer 3 lately and I like it very much. I was never big into Warhammer Fantasy, but I like the setting a lot now and especially the Chaos Dwarfs. There is something about being an evil Babylonian dwarf with a giant hat and a demon fueled steam locomotive that just appeals to me for some reason. Needless to say, I was very happy when the Forge of the Chaos Dwarfs DLC dropped recently and I'm loving it so far. With that said, there is some discourse going on around this DLC, mostly related to the price. I like this expansion and I like what it brings, but I'm gonna have to be honest. If I was not such a big fan of the Chaos Wars, then I would not have gotten it at full price, because hoo wee, this baby is pricey. At full price, this expansion costs 25 euros, and god damn, is that expensive for a DLC pack. Especially considering that DLCs for Total Warhammer in the past this size were usually cheaper. Now, the people who play Paradox games might laugh at this, but keep in mind that this is not a Paradox game. This is a Total War game and in general has Creative Assembly been slightly better with a DLC policy than Paradox has. You're not gonna get screwed over for not having a DLC for Total Warhammer 1 that was released all the way back in 2016 or something. I have seen a lot of back and forth about whether this price really justifies the content, because while the content is good, it also only comes with three legendary lords as opposed to four, which was the standard in Warhammer 2. Many people have been angry about this, and rightfully so, I have to say, but there is however one unfortunate observation I will have to make. This game is relatively niche. Warhammer is pretty big, but keep in mind that Total War is a series that's only played by a relatively small group of people. This is not like a big game like the next Mario or Call of Duty game. As a result, you're going to run into the consequence that stuff is gonna be pricey. Why? 
Because that's just how capitalism works. Niche stuff like this only appeals to a small select group of people. So big publishers like Sega want to get as much money out of this as possible. If you want to play a Warhammer Total War game, then your other options are limited. So obviously you, they're gonna charge premium prices for it because they know that people will buy it anyway. Also, this is a Games Workshop product and Games Workshop stuff just tends to be way more expensive than it has any right to be. People who play the tabletop will know. I am decently first in how our capitalist economy works, so this is maybe why I'm not as shocked about this, uh, about this all as some other people are, but that is unfortunately the sad reality of things. My advice would be to get stuff on either some kind of steam sale or do the thing that I'm, that I'm not allowed to speak out loud here. As for other game news. Here is our release of DLC recently. I've not gotten it yet, though I probably will at some point. Am I gonna review it like I did the game? Maybe. It depends on how I feel about it. Heroes Hour as a whole did not really blow my mind, and as far as I can tell is DLC mostly gonna be more of the same, so I cannot really get that excited for it if I'm honest. In said Heroes Hour video last year, I said that we might be entering a Heroes of Mythomatic Renaissance, and I feel that I might have jumped the gun on that one a bit too quickly. It is no secret that a significant portion of the Heroes of Mathematic fanbase tends to be from Eastern Europe. And I don't know if you have kept up with what has been happening in Eastern Europe for over a year... Yeah... The war in Ukraine has basically torn the community apart, and most projects have had their development progress slowed down by a lot. Things are better now, but it has been going rough for a while. The Horn of the Abyss project has had little sporadic updates on the development of the new factory town, and while I'm pleased to report that they're nearing the end stretch of development, it remains to be seen if we will see it released this year. I'm hoping for maybe a fall release, but I'm not expecting anything for certain. On the upside, VCMI, the open source implementation of Heroes 3, has made massive strides since last year. They've gotten back into a regular release schedule every 3 months or so, and it does seem that they've gotten more programmers, because it's actually close to feature complete now it seems. This is good for me, because it means that VCMI might become viable for future projects of mine. We'll see how that will go. What else is there? Oh, right. The Battle of the Wild sequel is uh, looking good. I was a bit concerned for most of the trailers, but I do feel that with the release of the gameplay trailers that they've changed enough to make it feel like a more unique experience. So yeah, I'm looking forward to playing Zelda Gmod. Age of Wonders 4 also got announced, so that's coming, I guess. I'm not sure yet if I will play it, since in general have the Age of Wonders game left me relatively cold, but I do admit that this one does look pretty interesting. Hoping I actually, li hoping I actually like it now. <laughs> Final subject of the video, and I've left the most annoying for last. So, the Dutch provincial elections were in March, and these are the elections people usually care the least about over here. Nevertheless, despite my growing disgust of Dutch politics, I decided to vote anyway, and by the gods did it feel like I was throwing my vote away. I knew from the start the results were gonna be bad, but I did not expect them to be this bad. Turns out that the Reactionary Farmers Party got the most votes. Which, if you've watched my video last year, you should know that I'm not a big fan of them. Though the upside is that the big winners of the last elections, the far-right FED, lost a fuckload of seats. So I guess we switch out one far-right party for another. The cabinet parties in general lost across the board, so the fractionalization of Dutch politics is continuing apace, it seems. Honestly, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. My main problem is that our environmental collapse is probably gonna be even worse now with these reactionary chut farmers in charge, and the deadlock about the nitrogen compound crisis has been worse than ever. I don't know, maybe we will get lucky and they will pull an FAD and fall apart like they did. If anything, these elections have shown me more and more that I feel that voting is just pointless for me. Nowadays my choices in voting are what flavor of liberal or far right party I would like. Maybe next time I will scribble, scribble a penis on the ballot or something. I honestly don't know. Anyway, I think that's all it for me. I, I think I'm finally caught on now. Bye! Mm.